Saturday morning, time to kick off the experts program on Power Talk Radio. And Luis Alvarez, CEO of the Alvarez Technology Group, joining us right now as we kick off Car Week in Monterey County. Luis, welcome back. Thank you, Mark. How are you today? Doing pretty good. So you guys had the big Pasadena Car Show yesterday. Actually, it yep. seems that Car Week is starting earlier and earlier every year. And I think we had events on Thursday. I wouldn't be surprised if Car Week morphs into two weeks of events because there's not enough there's not enough days in the week to hold everything, every event. Event, you know, during the yeah. actual car week itself. And I could see this becoming a two-week affair on the Monterey Peninsula. Oh, yeah. I mean, and everybody wants to get in on it. It's not just the venues. It's the, the car clubs and it's it's crazy. And I agree. I think there's just not enough time during one week to get everybody in, especially if you, you're tending to do it toward the end of the week, like on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're going to find that it might become a two-week event. That'd right. be cool. It is the largest event of the year on the Monterey Peninsula. And for the, ho- for the hospitality industry, which is where the majority of people on the peninsula and in Monterey County work. You know, the two big industries are agriculture in the Salinas Valley and hospitality on the peninsula. This is really where these folks, and I'm not talking about just the business owners. Obviously, the business owners do very well during that time. But the people that work in restaurants, the wait staff, the cooks, the dishwashers, this is one of the biggest weeks of the year for them. And then for folks who want to pick up some part-time work, all of these events that come into town that need people are paying them, in some instances, over $20 an hour to take tickets or to bar back or to serve. And this is temporary work. So the ripples into our local economy are tremendous for this event. And I know for a lot of people, the traffic gets them down and the noise and everything like that. But it's really necessary because for a big part of our population, it is their livelihood. And especially since we didn't have it last year, a lot of people were really hurt by not having car weeks. So the fact that we have it this year and it looks like it's going to be bigger than it's ever been before, I, by my way of thinking, is not such a bad thing. No, not at all. I think it's, uh, you know, there's a pent up demand, as we like to say, for a lot of live events. And, and I think we're seeing that this week. Hey, let's check a story in USA Today here that we want to talk about. And it's robotic police dogs have privacy watchdogs worried about. First off, Lewis, what are we talking about here? And what's the genesis of robotic police dogs? Where is the demand for this coming from? Police departments all over the, the country have, have been using technology technology in different ways over the years. You know how recently even bomb disposal teams have been using robots to go up toward suspicious packages and and pick them up and and examine them rather than sending human beings in there. And so the idea of using robots isn't necessarily new, but what police departments are now doing is they're starting to purchase these robots from a company in Boston, Boston Robotics. And these are, they look like dogs and they walk like dogs and they're able to essentially go into places that cops may not necessarily want to go into to check things out. They have cameras. They're capable of examining packages and those sorts of things. But some people are concerned. You know, they, we have these visions of the robots taking over the world. And, and you know, we've there's been a lot of science fiction movies and stories about robots, uh, you know, displacing human beings. And so they're getting some pushback in, in certain places. But I don't think that's going to change. I think robots on police forces is something that you're going to see more and more of. Do they bite? They do not bite. They're 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 pretty mindless when it come when you come to think about it. They only do what they're told to do. For example, the the police department in Honolulu is using these dogs to go into homeless encampments and check on people remotely so that they don't have to expose their officers to potentially, you know, COVID or anything else that might be spreading through these uh, these camps and they can talk to the people that are there, check in on them, take their temperature, uh, ask them questions and and it's, you know, with two-way audio and video be able to, to interact with them without exposing the, the officers to potentially harmful situations. Um, and if these robots get kicked or get spit on or, you know, get pounded on, it's okay. They can take it. Now, how do they control these rob- robots? Is there a police officer either at his patrol car or back at headquarters using some sort of a joystick to run this thing? Uh, yes. Voice commands and not necessarily a joystick, but a controller of some sort is what's being used. And Boston Dynamics, the company that makes these things, are allowing the these officers, these police departments to modify some of the software to a limited extent, but they've also put a lot of controls in there that will prevent police departments doing things like, you know, giving, you know, adding any sort of armament to these robots. Those sorts of things are prohibited by their, you know, their the code that they're, the firmware that they've uh, put into the uh, devices so that they can't go rogue on them. But apparently in New York, they tried using one of these and all of a sudden people saw it. They started making videos of it and they went nuts and it 
created yeah. such an outcry, an anti-electronic police dog outcry, that the uh, NYPD returned the dog, which they called DigiDog. They returned it back to its maker, Boston Dynamics. And that's that's really on that police department for not getting the public ready for seeing these robots working parks and other areas where police are normally seen. And that's what the police department in Honolulu did um, much better is that, you know, they informed the public, hey, we're getting this robot. Here's its purpose. It's completely harmless. It's just another tool in our tool chest. It's nothing that's going to attack you or, you know, render you uh, emotionless or anything like that. It's just a way for us to expand the services that we provide the public. And so it's been much more accepted there. Well, this is an interesting thing. It's going to continue moving forward. We wonder if we'll see them in Monterey County at some point. Have you heard anything about either Monterey PD or Salinas PD looking at a DigiDog? I haven't uh, specifically heard anything, but I have talked to a couple of uh, my friends who are officers in Salinas, and they say that they expect that as soon as they're available and and more affordable, that Salinas will be investing in them just like everybody else. Right now, they're about, what, $150,000? At least that's what Honolulu's PD paid for one. Yeah, it's it's about $150,000 to $200,000, depending on the model that you get. So it's uh, more than most small police departments can afford, but you never know. Do you think you'll get one? Oh, yeah. Once it's available and I can afford it, I'm going to have... It doesn't require me to take it out and let it run around to do its business. It can just sit there and be and always be my friend. So why not? <laughs> I wonder what Lightning thinks of this. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Lightning will like the robot at all. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Luis Alvarez, CEO of the Alvarez Technology Group, joining us today on Power Talk Radio. Online, it's AlvareztG.com. At AlvareztG is the Twitter handle. And Luis, the toll-free number for the I-Team. Give us a call at 866-78-I-Team. It's 866-784-8326.